Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important work being done to advance civil and human rights for Asian Americans with guest John Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. There's so much that has been in the news, I think, every week, right? And particularly uh, this week. And, and I'm so glad that we're able to discuss the fact that 22 million people of Asian descent make up 7% of the U.S. population. The community as a whole is the fastest growing ethnicity group, although covering quite a bit of territory uh, in the United States. So you have an incredible diversity, uh, Chinese, Indian, Philippine, Vietnamese, and Korean, and Japanese being the, the largest groupings, but there are so many other uh, groupings. And that's not even to mention people like in my family who are uh, of, of mixed descent. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about your perspective on Asian American identity and the history that we have here. What does America look like when it comes from the perspective of somebody who is an Asian American? Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for having me on the show. And certainly there's a couple of things that come to mind when we're talking about Asian American identity. Uh, first is the diversity that you mentioned. And we're talking about over 50 different nationalities, ethnicities, over 100 different languages and dialects. And so there's this rich diversity we have to talk about. Sometimes people think of Asian Americans only as East Asian Americans, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, or they only think about Indian Americans or South Asian Americans. But the reality is that it's very complex and it leads sometimes to unfortunate stereotypes. It leads sometimes to perceptions of our community that don't exist. So I think it's very important to unpack all of that. Uh, to understand sort of the nuances between all of these different ethnicities, different nationalities, to understand where the needs of our community are and where there have been successes, but also where there is a lot of progress that needs to be made. And forgetting the the diversity within the community is is it seems to be a penchant that we have. It's sort of like designating people uh, Latin Hispanic, right? Huge, incredible diversity. And when it comes to Asian communities, Arguably, given the ling linguistic variety that that uh, one has, it's even uh, more pronounced, right? That that fact of difference within a community that is uh, described under one word uh, needs to really be uh, addressed. So when you try to serve this incredible community, what kind of special challenges do you have as as you're trying to do honor to these um, to these uh, individuals who share some experiences in common, but also do honor to that to, to difference within the community. You're absolutely right. So number one is to think about where our communities are most vulnerable and where the greatest needs are. So for our organization, it's thinking about that. Uh, and oftentimes that is whether it's Southeast Asian Americans, whether it is in certain cases, Filipino Americans, there's different variations that we have to think about there. Uh, but it boils down in some ways to, if you will, two stereotypes that we oftentimes have to fight that unify our, our community. Now, on one hand, you're right. There's a lot that would suggest that our community is divided about a lot of things. But there's two that really unify our community. The first is what we call the perpetual foreigner syndrome. This notion that no matter how long we're here in the United States, that we must not be quote unquote American, that we are foreign or from a different country and owe our allegiance to that different country. Uh, and that is a common experience to all Asian Americans. A second fairly common experience to all Asian Americans, although it has nuances, is this notion of being a so-called model minority that does not have needs. This notion that, that Asian Americans have done relatively well, and therefore, so when we're talking about the needs of our, our community, that they're not the same, or that, that we don't need to pay attention to our community in the same way. So I think those are two things that really unify our community, and certainly two things that I consistently think about when I'm thinking about what my organization needs to do to serve our community. Let's take the first uh, item first. Uh, my families uh, came here uh, in the at the turn of the century, uh, or, uh, the early 1900s, and then the middle of the century as a, as a result of war and violence and so on. So we're relatively um, we're relatively recent immigrants, 100 years. Uh, 
Talk about the history of Asian migration uh, of different communities to the United States. Sure. So Asian migration is interesting because it is both relatively recent and very long lived. I say relatively recent because even as close as 1960, Asian Americans were less than 1% of our American population, whereas now, as you know, we're over around 7% of our population. And so there's that huge growth that we've seen in the last 60 years. And far more widely today distributed around the country, whereas in the earlier uh, eras of the United States, the, the concentrations were basically in the coastal areas and in particular cities, right? That's absolutely right. And that goes to that that piece around the historical evolution of immigration when it comes to United, uh, Asian Americans and the United States. Because certainly on one hand, you could trace it all the way back to the, the 18th century, but certainly you saw a large portion of immigration starting with Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans towards the latter part of the 19th century, among other things to build, build our transcontinental railroad. You know, the Asian Americans, Chinese Americans were doing some of the most dangerous work, dynamiting through the Rocky Mountains to get to right. Promontory Point. Um, and so that's part of our history. You know, it's part of our history in terms of Filipino farmers in California, uh, farmers in Hawaii, in helping our agricultural system here in the United States. So it does go back a long way. You think about uh, Americans of Japanese descent that were fighting in World War II for the American government even while literally their relatives were behind chain link fences here in the United States because of incarceration on the, the alleged suspicion, which was never proven true, that they somehow were agents of the Empire of Japan. So that's part of our history of, of immigration here in the United States. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, John Maricatani here in San Francisco gave me a fantastic interview in which she talked about her experiences having been inc uh, incarcerated through these uh, concentration camps that we had in this country in, in that uh, fear of Japanese citizens, right? And, and her family were, were taken and, and incarcerated for a period of time. We've had these waves of, of fear. And then we have today this whole um, competition between various uh, uh, countries in the United States that then become um, tinged with racism, right? I mean, we have the same kind of competition with Russia, which is largely, although not entirely, viewed as a, a white country. And we don't have that much in terms of, of racism coming out against whites, but we do have that kind of racism coming out in our competition with China. How do we deal with that? How do we change our attitudes in which we understand that America is comprised of so many different people of different uh, of different heritages, and we can actually come together as one country and compete without that tinge of racism. Yeah, and, and thank you for bringing that up because I think that is a part that's very difficult here in the United States right now. Unfortunately, it has been part of our history because just as we we talked about in World War II, uh, Americans of Japanese were descent were targeted. After 9-11, South Asian Americans, Muslim Americans were targeted. Uh, certainly, even during the, the auto trade war between the United States and Jap Japan in the 1980s, that was when we saw the murder of a person named Vincent Chin in Detroit, who was murdered because there were a couple of out-of-work out of auto workers that thought that he was Japanese uh, and therefore blamed him for them losing their jobs, right? And so right now, we have strategic competition against the Chinese government. And let me be clear. I mean, there are things that the Chinese government that are doing that we should be calling them out for, whether it's human rights with the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, whether it's democracy in Hong Kong, and some of their trade policies. But we need to be smart in separating the Chinese government and the authoritarian regime from the people of China, from a society, from a group of people. And, and you will notice that I typically will always say Chinese government when I'm referring to policies. That's one small step, right, to making sure that we distinguish between governments and authoritarian regimes and the people themselves, right? Because what we have seen over those last few years is independent of COVID-19, because of these tensions with the Chinese government, we have seen increased levels of hate against the Asian American community. Now, how do you serve the South Asian, East Asian across that, that, that divide? A lot of organizations 
uh, that grew up in the United States in the early days had an East Asian tilt because South Asian immigration waves are more recent. Now, we have this definition of Asian, which is is uh, so much broader, and a lot of organizations are having some challenges in being viewed as embracing uh, all sides of, of, of that enormous identity. How do you deal with that, John? Well, part of this is because sort of one fundamental principle for us is this fight against being perceived as foreign, right? And that is common, whether you are South Asian American, East Asian American, Southeast Asian American. We have that same issue. Uh, the second is sort of the stereotypes around who we are as people. And this unites particularly East Asian Americans and South Asian Americans as people that are good at math and science, people that are quiet, but not necessarily leaders, right, at, at companies or at law firms. Or other you see places. it sometimes in our in our executive search recruiting, where you have cultural attributes being ascribed to uh, being leaderly or not leaderly, uh, being aggressive or not ag- aggressive. And, you know, sometimes we'll be sitting in there and we'll be saying, look at the results. I mean, that's why we do this sort of search by results process, because results end up finessing our preconceptions of, of how cultural attributes play out. If somebody achieves results and you see a pattern, mm-hmm. great results, it's whatever they're doing, whatever magic they have, they have the magic, right? No, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I think, and that's part of it is like being able to make sure that people understand that, understand some of their own internal biases, right? In terms of what makes a good leader, what makes, whether it's a good leader in business, good leader in government, et cetera. Um, and sort of- Man, woman, back. other identity, tall, short, different ages, right? I mean, we all have our preconceptions. So when, when, you're, when you're talking about- this preconception that is imprinted upon uh, Asians so often of this sort of model minority, it, it ends up becoming a barrier, doesn't it? It absolutely is a barrier. It's a barrier for a few different reasons. I mean, one is just that it's inaccurate because like I've said, you know, there are certainly Asian American groups that, if you will, from a social economic standpoint, uh, do relatively well compared to the mean, uh, but there are many groups that are being left behind. Number two is if you think about this issue, it becomes what I call self-limiting. And what I mean by self-limiting is that because people perceive that Asian Americans are doing well, they do not listen to the needs that we actually have. They say, oh, you guys don't have needs. You guys don't have issues that need to be addressed at a structural level. Perhaps the most dangerous thing, though, about this model minority myth is that it's divisive because it creates this notion that there's this minority group that is somehow making it, right? And by doing that, it is almost suggesting that the United States does not suffer from racism, that we don't suffer from structural issues, and that because there is this one minority group that is making it, the other minority groups must be doing something wrong, that it's their fault that they are not doing as well. So that's and interesting, so, the, the yeah. idea of creating co- of, of creating a characterization that then creates a competition, that then creates division. That's it, you think that's part of this? That is absolutely part of it because if I talk to whether it's the African American community, Latino community, sometimes that that that's some of the issues that come up is that there are these misperceptions about sort of where we where we stand, what our needs are, and it is creating this construct that we are fighting against each other, which is not the case when you're talking about the inequities that exist in the system. So what you're saying is part of what's going on is this 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 attitudinal um, thing that that prevents uh, people from coming together with common interests and making common cause, right? That, that's right. And literally, if you look back at the history of the, the term model minority, this uh, occurred starting in the late 1960s. It was precisely presented to show that the United States was becoming a post-racial society and that our civil rights issues were behind us. And by doing that, it really was minimizing the pain and suffering of communities, especially the African-American community, which where there still were a lot of inequities, right? So so you're absolutely right, is that it's creating this construct where we end up fighting against each other rather than recognizing there's just so much more that unites all of us. So let's talk about some of the pain that, that you do see within different uh, Asian communities. Let's talk a little bit about the 
the uh, experience of, of older family members and uh, particularly of women uh, where you where there's a there is a kind of a hidden um, uh, trauma uh, that uh, that many Asian communities um, experience. Could you talk a little bit about some of the special challenges that uh, people of of different cultural traditions, different family traditions, find when they come to the United States and they're wrenched into a different uh, cultural context over the over the uh, fifty uh, years, two three generations. Um, that that family life unfolds. Sure, this is and this is pretty deep in, in many ways, right? Because if you're talking about the culture challenges, number one is coming to a country where you have no language base, and then being forced to adapt, right? And then especially if you are older, uh, especially if you are at the time many of who were immigrating with families, the women were not working then it leads to a certain isolation, uh, inability to sort of, sort of really integrate into society in the same way. You couple that with, frankly, you know, at the time, and one might say, still say uh, a pretty chauvinistic male-dominated attitude in many parts of Asia, which is true historically in many parts of the world, uh, it really starts to even further erode some of the sort of or create mental health issues within, within our community. Then you add in one final stigma, which is the uh, the stigma about talking about your own difficulties, especially mental difficulties and, and mental health issues. Uh, it really creates a community that is very very vulnerable. And so when and you, you have, have the separation with this with, with this with the generations as well, right? Sometimes the children can still speak the language, but the grandchildren can't. The uh, grandchildren are acculturated into a culture in which young people are not necessarily, uh, they don't necessarily stay at home and they don't necessarily take care of their elders in the same way. It's hard on many levels. That's right. Because if you think about children and grandchildren, you know, most of them obviously here in the United States will speak English, whether they retain their Asian language or not becomes increasingly difficult, especially once you get to that third generation, the, the grandchildren. And then it does disrupt, if you will, the, the family system. Right. Because the Asian American cultures, by and large, still have a long tradition of having more extended family as part of that that extended family unit uh, rather than just a nuclear family, if you will. But if you have an extended family where the language bears exist even within that family, it becomes very difficult all around, especially for the elder who feel increasingly detached from you know, sort of from their 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 community, literally their community. So you have silence, you have shame, you have isolation, you have language uh, issues, and and what you end up, and then this, and then imprinting this sort of model minority idea, right? There's, it, it's kind of doubles down on on you know how can I have a problem because I'm part of a my, model minority, right? That, well, that's exactly. Right. That, that's exactly right, is that for many in the community, and this, again, extends not just to the first generation, but generations down, is this notion that, that well, people keep on saying that we are successful, so I can't portray any sort of vulnerability, right? I can't show that I am not successful. I can't, I have to somehow sort of hide my shame. Oftentimes you talk about that, or people hear about that when it comes to the Asian American community. But obviously, if you don't seek out help for those types of issues, then it leads to longer term consequences. Now, part of what what has happened within the Asian communities and cross uh, communities is to counter this type of isolation. And there are other there are other issues which we're going to get to where you have community centers being built up. You have uh, groups coming together to uh, to create contact amongst elders, amongst themselves, amongst people of similar language and Similar generations, you have um, all sorts of uh, events, churches, uh, and so on. Um, so, talk a little bit about about the network of organizations that create community. That is that that is this, as so many other communities in the United States have done, coming together to identify issues. And your organization is one of that network, right? Identify issues, create solutions develop funding, develop support in order to address these these problems uh, and not continue to wait for somebody else to create a solution. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So part of this is trying to make sure that at the very hyper-local level, 
there are these community centers that are reaching out across all segments within our community. And again, this is part of where being a quote unquote newer uh, community, right? Recognizing that Asian Americans have only come to the United States in larger numbers in the last 40, 50 years that our community is still developing, right? And, and to make sure that they have the resources. Uh, and part of this is, is as simple as having, you know, and this is what makes uh, places like uh, Monterey Park so tragic is that's precisely what that dance hall was trying to do. Right. Is pro- provide a gathering place for our elderly to have communion with each other and share community. Uh, and so to have that turn into such a tragic event, especially during Lunar New Year, makes it very hard uh, and has taken an extreme emotional toll uh, on our community. So it's basically an attack, whatever this psychologically disturbed individual was about. It's 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 an attack on community. It's an attack on cohesion. It's an attack on on this um, this group of people who have found um, a solution within um, within the context of a dance hall, and then you you basically disrupt it. And the people afterwards who were saying we are determined not to be disrupted. We are determined to forge community. We are determined not to live in fear. That is a heroic act, isn't it? It is. And, and uh, you know, kudos to those local organizations that continue to build these structures. I, I think certainly one of the things that we have seen because of the anti-Asian hate during COVID-19 and during these tensions I've talked about with the Chinese government is that we do have more of our youth that are reaching out to our elderly. Uh, you know, it's first started when we saw the anti-Asian violence where the youth would serve as, if you will, ambassadors that would help their elderly walk to the neighborhood grocery store, get groceries, you know, provide uh, sort of escort services, if you will, to, to make sure that they feel protected and safe. So if there is a silver lining uh, through all of this is I do see many communities where we're seeing greater connections between the younger generation and the older generation where it was more difficult before. John, let's let's talk a little bit about the specific role that Asian Americans Advancing Justice has in this in this enormously complex ecosystem. Talk about your your organization's founding, its mission and how you execute that mission. Sure. So AJC was founded in 1991 to really serve as a national voice especially here in Washington DC for the Asian American community. It was set up as a pan-Asian American organization, recognizing a lot of the needs that we talked about with respect to the perpetual foreigner myth, the model minority myth. So for our organization, we focus on federal advocacy and we focus on litigation among other things. So whether it's relations with the Hill and the administration to make sure that our policies are implemented or advocated for, Uh, We litigate. So whether it is around census where that citizenship question was suggested in back in 2018 or voting rights issues, you know, we will be in court to protect our community. And then the third aspect is with respect to our community itself. And we have a network of over 250 community partners nationwide. You know, we talked about the fact that the Asian American community is diverse. And so many of these community partners will serve individual ethnicities or individual communities. And part of our job is to stitch them together, both sometimes to provide them resources, uh, whether it's technical assistance or or uh, subgrants at times, but perhaps even more importantly than that is to get them all together on occasions to give them best practices, to tell them what's going on nationally, what they should think about locally, right? Especially if we think about some of these issues that we're dealing with, whether it's around Asian American history, whether it's around education, you know, to make sure that they have a space that they can connect with each other and learn from each other. So when, when you take a number of these issues that we've already discussed and we start to map it to your role, we talked about the challenges that uh, our elders have, and particularly uh, elder women um, of, of uh, various Asian groups, and, and that we don't necessarily pay attention to those issues. So part of your job is when you're lobbying on the Hill about those types of programs to make sure that the needs, the special needs of that community is taken into account and discussed as legislation is being drafted. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And then to lift up, you know, if we're talking about women's issue, 
organizations that are specifically working on Asian Pacific American women's issues, right? To make sure that their voice is heard at the table. Uh, in that sense, we try to serve as a connector, right? Both to make sure that our issues are heard, but the individual voices that represent those communities are actually heard as well. And then we've also talked about the idea of the perpetual foreigner uh, myth, right? There's, and that can unfold in terms of being challenged in an order a number of times at the voting booth. It could be challenged um, as uh, executing your, your normal rights as a citizen, right? And that also, that to, to um, ameliorate those challenges, to stop those challenges, to uh, create this sense of we're serving America and reminding people, reminding people on the Hill that this fastest growing voting group is also uh, a group that needs to receive attention. Uh, that also is a big issue. That's that's exactly right. So you, you, this happens in a couple of ways. Using the example of voting, right, is, you know, certainly when you think about voter ID laws or things along those lines, you know, there's some of it that might make sense. But if you're looking for, say, an exact match between an ID and sort of your different forms of identification, for an Asian American community, it becomes difficult. So my American name, so to speak, is John Yang. It sounds pretty simple. My born name is Yang Zhongyuan, you know, which it gets spelled in any number of ways, depending on what type of translation system you are using throughout our American history. Yang Chunwen? <laughs> Zhongyuan. So like on my original passport, it would have been spelled C-H-U-N-G-Y-U-A-N. I think mm -hmm. under the new pronunciation guide, it would be C-H-O-N-G-Y-U-A-N, something like that. But that's a problem, like, or, or Z, actually, it's Z-H-O-N-G, right? But like, so if you're asking for an exact identification, right, when you're going into the voting booth, that's going to be problematic. Uh, and so why is it that a citizen with that name should have more difficult voting than a citizen with the name John Smith? makes no sense, right? right? And so that's part of what we're trying to protect. Right. So so what you're basically uh, talking about is creating an understanding, right? In other words, I need to be given a pass because I, I'm not able to pronounce your born name with any kind of authenticity. You, you, you'll listen to it and you'll say, well, well, that's very amusing, Mark. Let's try it again, right? And I can do it 20 times and I'll probably still get it wrong. Now, that is a matter that uh, might never be able to be corrected because my tongue can't do it. But there are other uh, issues, there are other attitudes that I could have or that other people could have that can be corrected. And that's a matter of, of, of what you're doing. You're trying to, to take these, these matters of difference and create understanding, aren't you? That, that's exactly right. So like, Using that name example, I don't, in some ways, I certainly would not get offended if you can't spell my name correctly. But I would get offended if you say, that's too hard. You need to get a different ID that has a more American name. Right. That That's where we need to get a better understanding among people and think about what that means. How do you, what kind of positions do you take on these discussions um, uh, around uh, our education system, right? Where we're beginning to have um, AP courses, for example, in high schools, advanced placement courses that deal with um, with uh, different perspectives on American history. You've just uh, noted the the situation in Florida where you have a, a, a basically a, a governor who is standing up and saying, no, we, we can't teach this other version of, of uh, American history in one course because whatever. How do you see that in terms of how do you teach American history in a way that tells the story of different perspectives and different peoples and different experiences? How do you do that? Because you, you can't do that from a generic telling, can you? Well, you can't do that from a generic telling, but you could tell, tell it in an honest way. And what I mean by an honest way is just in a fulsome way, right, is to make sure that everyone's voices as part of that American history is heard. Uh, what I find troubling is when people are trying to force one version of American history that is only told with no offense from a white, straight white male perspective. That's not the only perspective of American history. Now, certainly none of us are suggesting 
that sort of there is that that it has to be told only from one perspective. But what we're asking for is historically, our my viewpoint has never mattered. The viewpoints of African Americans have never mattered. So why shouldn't we include those viewpoints in our telling of history, especially at the AP level, let alone the college level? Students are sophisticated enough to make their own analytic decisions. That's what we're trying to educate them to do. It's not about indoctrination. It's about exposing them. Just like we we teach students about Marxism in college, that doesn't mean we're trying to indoctrinate them on Marxism. It's trying to make sure we, we they understand these different theories that are out there. So it's a matter of uh, basically listening to, to each other, and particularly somebody who is trying to serve this enormously diverse uh, Asian community. You know there's not just one uh, version of history within uh, that community, and there's not one version of history across communities. Part of what, what we are about as Americans is about these intersection intersecting stories, isn't it? Intersecting histories. And that's one of the beautiful things about America, uh, is that if you look at our history, our history has always been, in a good way, diverse. You know, our, his, our country is one of the few countries that really is not founded on a specific ethnicity. It has always been founded on immigrants. And in that sense, we should be embracing that even more than, than we are right now. Seems like we're backsliding at times on that recognition that America, by definition, is diverse. America is should be celebrated for that. We've sometimes fumbled the ball a little bit on certain aspects of it, but we also try to correct ourselves when we fumble. And that's a beautiful thing. Well, it's so wonderful to have you here to instruct us and to uh, help me understand a little bit more about your work and, and such important work it is, John. John Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Thank you so much for sharing some of your work. Thank you for providing us insights and for an education. And thank you so much for galvanizing the community in, in making this country uh, so strong. Thank you. Thank you.